thank the Nathan for inviting me to uh, speak about um, my take on this subject. Um, I, I was um, wondering how I would fill 20 minutes by talking about data management. And as I put this together, I realized that I could probably talk about two hours about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, what always bothers me about my specialty is, is that every time I give a presentation, I have to waste about, I have to waste several minutes explaining what Pew is. And unfortunately, yeah, you'll have to sit through that because there's no real point in me talking about data if you don't even know what the data is of. So please bear with me. The Pew, Pew is a modern Burmese exonym for a people who once lived in what is now called Upper Burma in walled cities. We don't know what the Pew called themselves. They flourished during the first millennium CE and they assimilated with Burmese speakers who arrived around the 9th century CE. The last Pew text is from the late 13th century CE, and their language has been largely a mystery for a very long time. At this point, we know very little about the Pew language. We know that it is a Trans-Himalayan, aka Sino-Tibetan language, which is somehow related to the language that ultimately replaced it, Burmese. But apart from that, we really don't know much. What remains to the Pew language are three kinds of data. First are Pew language epigraphic texts in an index script, this background image here. The second type of data are Tang Dynasty Chinese transcriptions of the Pew language in Chinese characters. There's the Chinese transcription of the ethnonym Pew in red. These are very extremely limited in, in number and difficult to interpret. And the third remains of the Pew language are some borrowings in Burmese. If you attended last month's uh, workshop, there were one of the speakers talked about potential Pew loanwords in Burmese. So this is all that remains of Pew. The Pew has left no descendants. We just have two kinds of textual evidence in the Pew in the Pew script, in Chinese script, and the third type is are some words in Burmese that are thought to be of potential Pew origin. So most of my work involves the Pew language um, inscriptions, which are the largest body of evidence concerning Pew. This, these inscriptions are documented in several formats, one being photographs. Um, these photographs vary considerably in quality. We have both photographs taken from, the Cologne, from when Burma was a British colony all the way up to the present. Many of these photographs have been taken by the photographer James Miles of Archeovision. One might think that new photographs with, you know, in color and, and high resolution and so forth would be inherently superior, but often this is not true. Sometimes older photographs are better because items have been less damaged in the past. The photo, photo here is of the most famous Pew inscription of all, the so-called Pew Rosetta Stone, which has four sides and four different languages, one of them being Pew and the other three being in other languages. Photographs include, also include um, rubbings of inscriptions. So the previous photograph I showed you was of objects, but we also have photos of rubbings, including unpublished rubbings in the collection of Professor Janice Stargardt of Cambridge. And we also have so-called reflectance transformation imaging files, or RTI files, that were made by Olive Griffiths and shown here, James Miles of Archeovision. These RTI files are made from multiple photographs of a inscription. And they are put together into a computer file that when viewed with appropriate software, 
can simulate the experience of viewing the same inscription from different, using different kinds of lighting. In this example here, we see that um, these two vertical lines, which are pure punctuation marks, you can see different aspects of them in different lighting. This is a single RTI file, but by manipulating software, I can change the lighting and see things in different ways. We also, um, James Miles of Archivision has also made for us 3D photo, photo, photogrammetry models of smaller pew objects. We are able to, use, to rotate these things, enlarge them, and so on. So this, this, is, this is the kind of, these are the kinds of files that are generated from objects, photographs, fo rubbings, photographs of rubbings, and 3D models. Now, the problem is, how do I catalog and keep track of all of these things? When I first started working on Pew two and a half years ago with the mission to try to decipher the language, I only knew of a few Pew inscriptions, so I didn't feel the need to number them. I came to Pew studies from Kitan studies. Kitan is an extinct Central Asian language also primarily preserved in the form of inscriptions. And Kitan studies, for whatever reason, no one has ever come up with any kind of cataloging system. Um, so there are no universal numbers, there are no universal conventions, it's a complete mess. And I unfortunately inherited this chaotic mindset, which turned out to be a disaster because it turned out there were a lot more inscriptions than I had thought. Here is the so-called inscription house in Burma where there are multiple pew inscriptions. As a starting point to resolve this mess of cataloging, um, Charles de Roselle in the early 20th century came up with an initial inventory of pew inscriptions. His first inventory had just five items. He eventually enlarged us to have 15. More and more inscriptions were found over the following 80 years, but the problem with pew studies is that after the colonial period, um, Burma had gone through some mm, rough political times and pew studies basically were frozen in time. And so fortunately, a few years ago, Arlo Griffiths and Julie, Julian K. Wheatley picked up where de Rossell left off, adding 155 inscriptions to his list of 15 for a total of 170. And, the, and Arlo and Julian have collected these inscriptions in an Excel file containing these various fields. Now, what I could go on and on about all these fields, but the field of interest to me is numbering the numberless items. Now, how, in the, how are you going to, or how is one supposed to number these things? They, almost none of these inscriptions have dates, so we can't arrange them in any kind of chronological order for the most part. The few dates we have are terminus a quo. They tell us a, a point where we know that the, the, the inscription must po post date, but it doesn't tell us exactly when it was made. And a few dates are in a calendar we don't even understand. So we can't use chronology to help us organize these inscriptions. Geography is not all that helpful either, as they, most of the inscriptions come from three sites. So ultimately, we ended up using de Rossell's original 15 in, in their arbitrary order. And, we, and uh, the remaining 155 inscriptions were grouped into thematic groupings and numbered consecutively within each grouping. So 16 through whatever is the pure inscriptions in the stone, pure inscriptions in the poly language were another set, and so on. Unfortunately, new finds that fit into these earlier categories are just dumped at the end. And this is unfortunate, but unavoidable. And new finds are being found all the time. Here's an example that I found while I was visiting in Burma exactly a year ago. We went to an archeology span office and boom, we were told, hey, we just found this two days ago. Now, what I do with um, all of those photographs and whatever, 
is I, tr is I try to transliterate the text. So this is taking the raw material, taking, taking the raw materials, we're converting it already into photographs and so on. And this is the next stage so where I take the text and try to convert them into letters. Now, generally speaking, P is written in the index script. They are conventions of how to convert index scripts into Roman script. And so generally we follow them. But one huge problem is that we don't know exactly how P was pronounced. And this is a problem because it means we don't really know how meaningful this transliteration is. We're just, I'm just mindlessly copying letters without knowing exactly what they stood for. Um, I'll get the, and um, then I take these letters and I put them into XML files, one per inscription. These XML files are in the Equidoc standard and they contain all sorts of information such as other people's readings in the past. As a phonologist, I then take these readings and chop them up into little pieces like consonants and vowels, and these are put into columns in an Excel file. Now, earlier today, we've, we've, come, up, we've come up with, uh, we've encountered the theme of version control, and why is that important? Well, here's a personal example. As I said before, we don't really know much about how Q is pronounced. We're just mindlessly copying letters and converting it into Roman script. So there is this subscript dot in Q that is very, very common. And for a century, people have had different arguments about what this dot stood for. Um, when we first started transcribing Pew, we just arbitrarily decided, OK, we'll just make this dot an apostrophe, and we'll stick it after the last constant before a vowel. Later on, we changed our minds and decided to mark this as an M with a dot, since M dot is a convention in Indology for writing superscript dots. We thought, oh, it'd be really clever to use M with a subscript dot to write a subscript dot. <laughs> now, here's where version control came in. This isn't just for 22nd century archaeologists. The problem was that uh, I've mentioned my Excel file. I've mentioned XML. Um, we also ha had RTF and text files. Migrating the data through all these different formats meant that when we, com when we changed our minds about how to transliterate Pew, it meant that we had to, of course, change all that other stuff in the other formats. And this is where version control became crucial because search and replace with Pew is a nightmare as I try to use regular expressions to do search and replace, but Pew um, structure is so complicated that a simple formula doesn't quite work. Also, there were typos and such where the apostrophe was in the wrong place to begin with. And so I did innumerable errors and had to convert things over and over and over again. And sometimes I would think, oh, I'm done. And then, and then I would, I, I also use GitHub, by the way. So I'd upload things to GitHub, and I'd discover, oh, god, it's all wrong. And so this is where version control comes in handy, because you go back to your old version. You try to diagnose where your search and replace went wrong, you undo that, you do the search and replace again, you re-upload to GitHub. So that, that's the value of GitHub for me personally, is this type of error, ma of, of error management, of discovering where I went wrong in the past, of restoring the old data, and so on. I've mentioned GitHub, um, the XML there, we then moved to the publicly accessible site, Corpus of Pew Inscriptions. Um, my attitude toward Pew decipherment is an open source kind of attitude. Um, 
I, I like the idea of having the public being able to look at the same data I do and come to their own conclusions about it. This website contains the latest version of the XML for the Pew inscriptions. It, it's synced with uh, our GitHub. It contains images of the inscriptions and a bibliography of Pew studies. Um, we've already mentioned Zenodo previously. Um, the, the XML, the, the photographs, the RTI files are publicly archived at Zenodo. The future steps with data include some that I forgot to mention here, so I will. Um, I've been talking purely about PewScript stuff. Future steps include well, if we just start with the Pew script, I'm working on an archive of images of Pew actuals. Actuals are our letter, our character combinations representing syllables. All this colored material here is a single akshara for the for the word for king that I transliterate as kadach. These actuals, um, I have taken screenshots of them and I am building an archive of them so I can try to break down the P script into its components and look at how different letters take different shapes in different environments and so on. All of this will eventually be publicly archived as well, but this is still in the compilation process. Using this analysis of P script, I hope to, to come up with a proposal for encoding Pew and Unicode and at some very late stage ultimately convert the Pew texts back from this transliteration stuff into the original Pew script in Unicode. Um, lastly, other data that I plan to work with in the future are are, for instance, the Chinese transcriptions of Pew, which have never been systematically analyzed. That too will all be publicly archived. And um, so I'm going to now end 12 minutes early, and, and we'll see if we can have a record number of questions. <laughs> Yes. Are all the inscriptions just about kings, battles, and donations, or, or is there some more interesting material in the inscription? Oh well, <laughs> well, the state of Pew studies, as I said, it, it, well, considering that we can't even, we don't, we hardly know how the language is even pronounced. Um, right now, we only know about two hundred words. And so, quite frankly, most of the inscriptions are incomprehensible at this point. I, I mean, I, what, what, I, what I do what, what, when I transcribe these things, I feel like some kind of mindless robot much of the time because I have no idea what these things are saying. Um, one saving grace of Pew is, is that it is an index script, so we, ha so we recognize the letters, but the effect is like, for mo for most speaker for most people looking for most people familiar here would be familiar you know, familiar with Indo-European languages the effect is is that of looking at Hungarian or Finnish where you recognize the letters but the text is just completely alien looking the language is very distantly related to Burmese and I have studied Burmese and frankly it really doesn't help a whole lot. So, so the point is, is that we just really don't know what most of these things are saying at all. Um, some are, some are, funer are funeral texts because we recognize things like die, we recognize dates, so we assume those are death dates, but we don't really know. And we assume that the king and the name on it is the name of the, de of the deceased, but this is all assumption, really. I mean, no one has really come up even with something as simple as a, a really good word-by-word -word analysis of these alleged funerary texts. 
we just recognize these words and people jump to conclusions. A lot of peace studies is highly conjectural and, and it, this is not really emphasized because people like pretending they know what they don't. <laughs> so so that, that, and anyway, going back to a more database theme, the fact that we just understand so little makes cataloging this stuff really, really difficult. I mean, I gave num just enumerating the inscriptions as an example, but just trying to figure out how we're going to convert this into letters. I mean, you can base it on indic conventions to some extent, but there are things like subscript dot and other oddities that have no indic basis. And I've argued with my colleagues back and forth, what are we going to do about this? And then it's like, oh, okay, well, let's search and replace and try it this way. No, and then let's do version control and undo that. And back and forth and back and forth. And that's because so much of this is just so un unsettled. I, I think what you may find of some interest in my, in, in, in my talk is that I'm dealing with the problem of cataloging almost total terra incognita. That's a very different issue with, from what other people are working with, I think. I mean, just, just trying to figure out what categories to put things in is a mess. I mean, the fact that, that you, know, you asked about the content of inscriptions, we, I really can't use that as a method of cataloging them at all. I mean, I don't know what these things are saying. And that's why our, our, the categories for the enumeration are just so crude. Uh, is it on stone or is it on metal? Yes. So um, you mentioned that uh, the the this that XML files as a, a zip file are all on Zenodo. Yes. And that the primary sources in terms of uh, photographs and RTI files and whatnot are on Zenodo. Um, <clears throat> RTI files are big, so I presume that you can't fit that all in one Zenodo record. So how how are uh, you keeping track of the relationship between the different Zenodo submissions? Each Zenodo submission is cataloged by the Pew inscription number. And I, and, and, and so I, I, I looked up things in Zenodo by those, by those numbers. And under each number, there's a huge file with the RTI and the photos. What I don't, frankly, what I don't like about Zenodo is that I can't just grab a single file out of these huge collections. Oh, well that has to do with how they're uploaded, I think. It, yeah. Because they were uploaded as zip files, you have to download the zip right, files. Right, right, take them if, apart. If I had uploaded them as individual files, then it would have been easier to use. Yeah, but on the other hand, then we would have like hundreds of full files per inscription, and that would be a different sort of, of problem. problem. Yeah, because RTI files require many, many photographs to create to create a single RTI file that can be viewed with simulations of different kinds of lighting. Yes? I know that you've made your data available in the Epidoc XML format. Um, I was wondering if you comment on how much work that was and what the benefits of that are. The benefits of Epidoc for me are that it it, it, a lot, it builds a bridge between Pew Studies and other kinds of epigraphy, I think. I, I, I mean, one weird thing about Pew Studies is that it, is, has, it has been basically an island, totally cut off from everything else. I mean, even within Sino-Tibetan linguistics, it is pretty much cut off from everything else. Um, when, I st when I studied the Epidoc uh, standard, uh, Danielle and I went to, of all places, Romania to take classes in Epidoc. We, we um, studied along with uh, classicists <laughs> using Epidoc for Latin and Greek. And the strength of Epidoc, I think, is that it's a shared format you, that is usable for any kind of epigraphy. And, and so Greek and Latin Epigrapher, epigraphy, epigraphy experts have encountered many problems already and have found solutions for them. Pew is still an infant field, barely explored, and so it is nice to have this body of expertise available that can be recycled for our own purposes without us trying to have to, trying to have to reinvent the wheel. And I find, I find that, that valuable. 
um, I mean, Pew is just so unstable and so mysterious that any kind of help I can get is very much appreciated. And, ep and using an existing standard like Epidoc that has been around for a long time helps toward that end.